This video is intended to be an overview of the reproductive system and early development. Um, not going into quite as much detail as, say, allied health majors would require. I have other videos uh, which are longer and uh, more uh, video components than that. Um, but just kind of a quick overview for just, you know, the general public or uh, students more in, you know, a non-major uh, uh, category. Um, so, while cells divide, most cells of the body divide through mitosis. And in mitosis, you can see that uh, two daughter cells are created, and they are identical in the number of chromosomes that they have. The mother cell that started division had uh, 46 uh, chromosomes, and now in the nucleus, and each of the two daughter cells then have 46 chromosomes in the nucleus. And this is the origin of most of the cells in our bodies, our skin cells, our muscle cells, our, our brain cells, you know, etc. Um, but the problem is it became time for the next generation and reproduction. These videos don't work. I, I'm sorry, these cells would not work as gametes. So for example, if two individuals were to fuse um, uh, say, uh, skin cells, um, these uh, uh, cells, and, and by skin, I'm sorry, I'm in this silly animation, it, it asks, uh, you know, if two individuals engage in a deep French kiss and the epithelial cell from the mouth of one individual fused with that of another, would you make a baby? And the answer is no, for many reasons. One is that the epithelial cells, they have two of each kind of chromosome. Look, there's two of the big ones, two of these, two of these, two of those. That's what we call diploid. And it turns out that diploid cells cannot make sex cells because if two diploid cells fuse, that would now create a cell that has four of each chromosome. Um, and while such uh, human embryos can be conceived, um, they don't make it uh, uh, to birth. So that condition is incompatible with um, with human life. And so sex cells, the gametes, have to be different from other cells. While most cells have two of each kind of chromosome, the word for that is diploid, that sex cells like this sperm or this ovum, they are haploid with one set of each chromosome. Now, if the 23 chromosomes from a sperm, which is a haploid cell, fuses with the 23 chromosomes of the ovum, which is a haploid cell, the resultant cell would then have 46 chromosomes and then be diploid and a new uh, individual uh, and a new uh, human uh, cell cycle could begin again. So uh, to begin the reproductive system, an important concept is there is a difference between cells which are haploid having one copy of each chromosome, and then cells which are diploid, which have two copies of each uh, chromosome. In the human life cycle, we begin as diploid embryos. So when you were conceived, you were a new diploid cell with two of each copy of, chromo uh, of each chromosome. That cell uh, divided by mitosis again and again and again and again, um, until you know you had you know the adult body that has you know a hundred a trillion uh, cells. Um, most of these cells are diploid. However, none of these could then serve as the gametes, which then allow for another generation. So in the body, there must be a new type of cell division, not mitosis, which gives diploid cells from parent diploid cells, but rather a new process called meiosis. Um, meiosis then would create haploid cells uh, that would not function as skin cells or muscle cells, but instead would function as uh, potential sex cells, gametes, uh, to engender the next uh, generation. And meiosis occurs only in uh, the gonads, testes in males and um, ovaries in females. And so meiosis is different from mitosis. Mitosis is one round of cell division and both daughter cells are diploid with two of each chromosome, while in meiosis, there will be two rounds of cell division. The cells divide once, then a second time, and now the cells have half as many chromosomes, one of each uh, kind for a total of 23, as opposed to 46 from, um, uh, from mitosis. And once again, when the 23 chromosomes from a sperm fused with the 23 chromosomes from an ovum. Now you have a new cell, a zygote, 
uh, which has now uh, 46 uh, chromosomes, and now a new human uh, uh, life uh, begins, uh, and now uh, with uh, 23 uh, chromosomes from uh, the sperm, 23 from uh, the ovum, um, and now this embryo with 46 can divide through mitosis again and again uh, on, you know, to make brain and bone and muscle, etc. Now, in the testes, then, uh, meiosis occurs. And, and really, if one thinks about it, the two main functions of a reproductive system are, one, to make haploid sex cells, and two, to allow these haploid sex cells to encounter the haploid sex cells of the opposite gender. Now, there can be other functions of reproductive systems as well. They make hormones, uh, which can not only affect the reproductive system, but other systems as well. But those are the two main ones. So in testes, there are cells uh, which then undergo meiosis. They divide once, all right? So uh, a primary spermatocyte divides to make two secondary spermatocytes. They then divide again um, to make spermatids. So meiosis occurs, and then the resultant daughter cells are spermatids, and they're haploid. They each have a big chromosome and a little chromosome in this example, but not two of each. So a diploid cell would have two of each. These are haploid cells. Notice that when we make gametes, two processes occur. The independent assortment of chromosomes, meaning that not all the blue or the pink ones coming from one parent or the other end up in the same sperm, and then crossing over where you know, some of uh, a man's uh, genes he got from his mother could actually be cut from his mother chromosome and pasted on, paste onto the chromosome he inherited from his father. This allows the uh, genetic information in different sperm then to be different. And the same too would apply in uh, ovaries. Now, um, so in the testes, meiosis occurs, uh, which is known as spermatogenesis. Um, but since spermatids are round and can't swim, a second process always uh, also occurs known as spermiogenesis, where these cells modify their shape, develop a long, um, flagellar tail so that they can swim. So two processes are occurring in testes. The meiosis of spermatogenesis, where um, uh, haploid uh, sex cells are made, and then spermiogenesis, which modifies them so that they can swim. If one were to look at a cross-section of the testis, one would see lots and lots of tubules where uh, this process is occurring. Uh, so as cells go from the outside, this is where they start, um, and then move towards the center, they are undergoing meiosis. Uh, and they you know, go through the first cell division of meiosis, the second division of, of meiosis. And then by the time they reach the center, we then have those um, haploid cells with the long flagellar tails, uh, the actual spermatogonia. Now, there's a number of, of steps involved, as you might uh, guess, and other you know, relevant uh, uh, points. And, and so I go through these in uh, various uh, videos here. But in essence, uh, testes consist of these long tubes, and it's here where sperm are made. They undergo meiosis and then modify their shape to become these, the functional male gametes, spermatozoa, um, as they are migrated towards the center. Once they are, you know, enter that lumen in the center, they can then uh, leave uh, the testis and uh, move onward. Um, there are a few other cell types in the um, testis, including the uh, cells known as interstitial endocrinocytes in the previous uh, video, if you wanted to watch, uh, where testosterone is made. So here is the uh, testis. And notice that there's lots and lots of these blue tubes. This is where the sperm are made. So testes make the functional male gametes. And then from there, they just have to then uh, travel through a number of tubes. So there's a number of short tubes here as the testis joins the next section, which is known as the epididymis. The epididymis is highly coiled. The tube um, you know, is almost 21 feet long, and it sits on each testis like a, uh, a hood uh, almost. And so uh, once being made, then much of the discussion of the male reproductive system then involves the tubes through which uh, the sperm uh, pass. And I go through these here. After the epididymis, uh, it passes through the uh, 
the vas deferens. And there you could see part of the epididymis with lots of uh, sperm um, in uh, the center. What you can see here in this monkey, where here is the testis, and then here is the epididymis uh, around it before the vas deferens, or in the cat, where there's the testis, the epididymis. Notice that the gonads are outside uh, the body in a pouch known as uh, the scrotum. Um, this allows them to be kept at a slightly cooler temperatures uh, because the male gamete is just DNA with a tail, essentially, and uh, the high body temperatures of warm-blooded uh, mammals would cause the sperm to be infertile. And so while all gonads develop inside the body uh, in embryos, ovaries and testes, in males, they leave uh, the body cavity and then uh, are suspended in uh, the scrotal sac uh, outside the body cavity where it is a few degrees cooler. If um, uh, the testes did not descend into the scrotum as is a a fairly common birth defect, which needs to be um, uh, fixed right after uh, a diagnosis in infant males. Or if, say, a man worked in you know, a pizza shop where there's an oven at waist level much of the day, or worked on uh, making asphalt for roads where there's a very you know, hot uh, you know, machine making asphalt, or if you know, men were to you know, spend too much time in hot tubs or wear very tight clothing that would hold the testes close to the body, um, then this could result in infertility simply because um, uh, the sperm need to be a few degrees cooler than body temperature or else they are infertile. Once the sperm are made, they don't work very well. Uh, so if you were to take sperm as they leave the testes and mix them with ova, fertilization would not be that efficient. And so uh, the uh, sperm will spend uh, a couple of weeks, maybe a month, traveling through this elongated structure known as the epididymis, which one can see here on the monkey or here in uh, the cat. Um, the epididymis in humans is highly coiled and would be about 21 feet long if it were uncoiled. Uh, when sperm enter the epididymis, they don't work very well, but when they leave, they are highly fertile. And so this is an important maturation time. If one were then to look in the epididymis, one would just see, once again, it's a very highly coiled tubule, 21 uh, feet uh, long overall. And in the uh, center, all right, so here, and there'll be more in the next um, uh, video, uh, there are sperm, which once again are being stored there and are slowly maturing, which increases their uh, fertility. Now, um, if sperm are not released, uh, then they can be recycled. And so men don't have to be um, as sexually active. Uh, unused sperm can be recycled. And if you notice, the cells of the epididymis have these long microvilli, which help not only in the secretion of factors, uh, which uh, help uh, the sperm cells mature, uh, but also can reabsorb um, unused sperm so that uh, nutrients can be recycled. Now, uh, the testes and the epididymis, they are in the scrotal sac but they had started uh, inside the body. And so that is why then from uh, the testis and epididymis, now um, the male reproductive tracts go back to the pelvic cavity because that's kind of where they, uh, they had started embryologically. And so this tube is the vas deferens, which will carry sperm, which started in the testis, matured in the epididymis. This will then carry it inside the body where it will uh, join with the urethra and then prepare for ejaculation. Now notice that the vas deferens is not the only tube uh, which is going to be form part of what's called the spermatic cord. There's also a testicular artery, there are testicular veins, there are lymphatic vessels, nerves, etc. because these are living cells and once transported from their bo the body, um, outside the pelvic ca cavity. Obviously, they still need arteries, veins, and other things. So what's called the spermatic cord is not just the reproductive tubule of the uh, vas deferens. There are other things as uh, well, the blood vessels, et cetera. Um, and so once again, the testis used to be inside the pelvic cavity, but then it left uh, the body uh, cavity um, 
as so that the testes could be cooler. Now it went through an opening known as the inguinal canal, and that inguinal canal is still uh, there in uh, males so that the arteries and veins uh, can leave, and that's why males then are uh, susceptible to inguinal hernias. Males have an opening or a pair of openings in the abdomen, which women lack because they have the opening through which the gonads left the pelvic body cavity and through which you know, these blood vessels, et cetera, they, um, uh, they remain um, you know, to supply uh, the gonads. And so these openings uh, then are the spaces where, uh, uh, you know, in uh, extreme, you know, stress, if a man were to lift something very heavy, a loop of the small intestine could go through that opening in an inguinal hernia. So notice that both male and female embryos, the gonad here in red, starts uh, high in uh, the uh, abdomen. It then drops to the pelvic brim in female embryos, but it will keep on going, even changing places with the kidneys. Notice how they raise. Um, and then it will keep on uh, going uh, in uh, males, not just ending here where it would in females, uh, but then actually then going into uh, the, the scrotal sac. Um, but then there would have to be an opening in the male abdomen, the inguinal canal, for, uh, uh, for uh, all of these components. Once the spermatic cord enters, in males, the urethra is not just a part of the urinary system that would eliminate urine because the vas deferens fuses with the um, uh, urethra, then uh, it also can carry semen. So for example, here's the bladder, there's the urethra, and in females, the urethra only transports urine, all right? But here in males in green, the vas deferens goes over a, uh, the ureters, and in the prostate gland forms this short ejaculatory duct, which joins to the uh, urethra, so that the urethra in males can carry both urine and semen. Now, there's more to semen than just sperm. There are a number of secretions, and that's why there are these other glands. These seminal vesicles here in red, which are behind the bladder, the prostate gland under the bladder, and then the bulbo-urethral glands between the bulb of the penis and the urethra. Um, so these can uh, secrete the food source, the fructose sugar that the, um, uh, the uh, sperm will use while uh, they uh, swim as an energy source. It will secrete the alkaline secretions, uh, which uh, then help to neutralize the acid of the vagina, and uh, you know other things such as androgen hormones, which not only affect the sperm, but also can cause uterine contractions in the woman, which help to move the sperm. And so there are accessory sex glands, seminal vesicles, a prostate, and bulbo-urethral glands as part of the male uh, reproductive system. The urethra in males, as I had said, uh, is both part of the urinary and reproductive uh, systems. And so it has a portion which goes through the prostate, a prostatic urethra, a portion which goes through um, the uh, external um, urethral sphincter known as the membranous, um, uh, uh, the membranous uh, urethra, and then as it goes through the penis, the penile urethra. Now, it was the first reptiles which invented both the penis and the clitoris um, so that they could practice internal fertilization. And then that is why, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, pair of organs can exist in amniotes uh, descended from the first uh, reptiles. Uh, the penis uh, has, in addition to the purple corpus spongiosum, which surrounds the urethra, um, it compares, uh, contains a pair of tissues, the corpora cavernosa, which can become erect. This is erectile tissue present in the penis and also in the clitoris, so that upon arousal, blood vessels dilate so that more blood then comes into uh, the corpora uh, cavernosa, uh, causing it uh, to uh, swell. Um, anything that would impede the flow of, um, of blood into uh, this corpora cavernosa. And here you can see it under the microscope, this erectile tissue which can store um, uh, blood would then be a potential cause of impotence in males uh, 
making it difficult for them to maintain an erection. This could be something physical, like lipid plaques and blood vessels, which would block blood flow, or it could be something uh, more psychological. So for uh, example, when men or women uh, feel an anxious or are under stress, part of the fight or flight response is to direct blood away from the reproductive system and towards muscles because during an emergency you know one should run or fight and not you know be concerned with um uh, with fooling around and so therefore uh, uh that also is a potential cause of impotence in males if you know the sympathetic division of the nervous system uh, is directing blood away from the uh the reproductive system so um, men uh, can make hundreds of millions of sperm uh, per day. And as we'll see, uh, sperm counts are important um, because so many sperm die before they reach an oocyte that if uh, men were to make uh, beneath, say, 20 million uh, sperm per milliliter of semen, uh, that they would then potentially have problems with fertility because so many um, uh, sperm would die uh, that uh, they might not uh, have enough reaching the region of the oocyte at uh, the uh, proper uh, time. All right. So once again, uh, the function, the primary functions of the male reproductive system are one to make two cells, two to have these two, and then there could be some function as well. So uh, making our reproductive system before we have actually decided on uh, a gender. And as a result, if one were to compare the male and the female reproductive systems in embryos, notice that they all have the same parts. They look identical. And that would include this pink Mullerian duct and this blue Wolfian duct. It would only then be later uh, that modifications would occur. So that one gender would lose the pink Mullerian duct and keep the Wolfian duct, the Wolfian duct becoming part of the vas deferens, whereas the other gender loses the Wolfian duct and keeps the um, and pink Mullerian duct, which becomes the oviduct and uh, the uh, uterus. Um, uh, but there are uh, homologies. So for example, other tissues such as the gonads develop either into the ovaries or testes. And externally, there are tissues which will either uh, develop into the penis or the clitoris, or either into the scrotal folds or the labia majora. And so there are uh, homologous uh, tissues between uh, males and uh, females. Uh, once again, the female reproductive system, uh, two of its primary goals are to create haploid sex cells and then to get these to where these can encounter uh, the haploid sex cells of males. It's, uh, the process of forming this is far more complicated. I'll point out a couple of, of points uh, here. Um, so the process begins the same, where meiosis will involve two rounds of cell division. Um, but note that the cell divisions are not equal. So in this first cell division, this cell got all of the, you know, the nutrients from the cytoplasm of the original cell, not this cell. Um, and the, that same process will occur again, so that um, uh, while male spermatogenesis produces four sex cells from each cell that begins, in females, there will be one sex cell, the ovum, and then two or three um, other structures which will disintegrate and not contribute uh, to uh, reproduction. These are known as polar bonds. So that is a difference between male and female uh, gametogenesis. Um, there are other differences as well. Uh, one of them is while sperm travel by themselves, uh, the oocytes, they develop as a part of a much larger structure known as a follicle. So notice that there are blue epithelial cells from the ovary that surround the uh, oocytes. And so as the oocytes develop and they undergo uh, meiosis, they're not doing so uh, on uh, their own, um, but rather they're doing so as part of a much larger structure known as a follicle. Uh, that's a follicle after it's ruptured. And, and so that needs to be uh, considered. Um, so uh, follicles at a certain stage you know, can be producing uh, estrogen, um, while then uh, the follicular cells which remain in the ovary after ovulation, uh, they then uh, produce uh, progesterone. And so um, uh, you know, that, uh, these are important uh, 
uh, important steps. Uh, another uh, difference between male and uh, female reproduction is the timing of events. Uh, so from when meiosis begins to when it uh, ends and the sperm are fertile, uh, we're talking you know, two months, you know, under uh, two months in males, whereas the situation in uh, females um, will take decades. And, and so um, uh, the process is far more uh, complex. Meiosis actually begins before birth and it doesn't end until fertilization. So notice that this cell is what left the ovary at ovulation. It's not an egg yet, it's not an ovum yet. It's a secondary oocyte. It will not finish its final division and become an oocyte until the sperm fertilizes. And so it actually requires fertilization before the true female gamete is made. At ovulation, cells which are almost gametes are released, the oocytes, but they still have to, release, uh, to finish one round of cell division. So notice here's too many chromosomes. So what has to happen is these chromosomes need to separate. One of the sets of chromosomes will end up in a polar body. The other will form uh, the chromosomes of the ovum. Um, but this only occurs after fertilization. And so then if one were to say, all right, well, how long does it take for uh, meiosis to complete itself in, uh, in women? The answer is meiosis actually begins before birth. Meiosis, the first uh, pro couple stages of prophase one uh, begin prior to birth and then it pauses. It then uh, uh, completes a bit more uh, during uh, menstrual cycles, uh, but then it pauses again and it doesn't complete until um, the end of, uh, it doesn't complete until the moment of uh, fertilization. Um, so this is fascinating, and it's actually, um, there's still a lot that's, you know, being learned. So for example, I teach anatomy and physiology uh, for allied health majors, and from earlier in my teaching career, if one were to compare, you know, what we thought we understood and what textbooks said, um, it's a little different now uh, with the female reproductive system, especially uh, the early parts of meiosis and when they're actually occurring. So it's, um, not only is it far more uh, complex, uh, than you know, what we observed in males, um, but also then uh, we're continuing uh, to learn, um, uh, uh, to learn uh, more. Um, perhaps the big area that uh, is you know, continually being discovered is the early steps. It was you know, once thought that uh, these primordial follicles, which have existed since birth, would then um, and complete their maturation in one month in, during one menstrual cycle, undergo ovulation. Um, but now we understand that uh, you know, it takes about a year uh, from when uh, the oocytes in primordial follicles uh, uh, initiate uh, their activation um, prior to the point where they can undergo ovulation. And you know, it's fascinating in the number of signals which are going from the oocyte to surrounding cells, the signals that are going from the surrounding cells to the oocyte. Uh, so it's you know a, a fascinating series of events, far more complex than was understood even until uh, recently. Um, uh, but uh, much of it would kind of uh, exceed what you know an overview of this type uh, you know would entail. So by all means, I have a number of videos which go into this in greater detail if you're interested. Um, in addition to signals which are occurring locally within the ovary, there's also hormones which are coming from the, uh, uh, the brain, the pituitary gland, two specifically follicle stimulating hormone. And then a second one, I'll mention it again in a second, called luteinizing uh, hormone. Follicle stimula uh, stimulating hormone will um, be essential for the development of the follicles in the final uh, stages of, um, uh, of meiosis. Uh, this is going on inside uh, the ovary. So while the early phases are largely FSH, FSH independent, the final stages require FSH as um, the follicle gets larger, even you know, having this space inside known as an antrum with a follicular fluid. Um, and uh, typically, uh, during a menstrual cycle, 
many follicles are potentially developing, but they're more or less competing against each other and only one will actually undergo uh, ovulation in a typical uh, month. And so there's a brief window of time where the FSH level is sufficient to allow uh, follicles to uh, develop their last um, uh, step uh, and you know, get to the vesicular follicle, which undergoes ovulation. Um, and uh, while there are many follicles which uh, begin uh, development, uh, once FSH level falls beneath this threshold, uh, they will fail. So all of these follicles are trying to mature to the point of ovulation uh, this month, but only one of them will and the other will have to generate. Okay. So uh, uh, multiple ones here will fail. Uh, only this one becomes then the vesicular follicle. Uh, ovulation occurs in of a follicle, and that is uh, caused by a surge in the second one of those uh, hormones released from the pituitary gland, a uh, luteinizing uh, hormone or LH. Uh, and so uh, right around the midpoint of the menstrual cycle, uh, this surges. Uh, this uh, will cause contraction uh, around, uh, there are smooth muscle cells around uh, the uh, follicle, uh, and there have been enzymes which have been making uh, it more likely to uh, rupture. So when this happens at the midpoint in uh, the cycle, uh, then the secondary oocyte bursts from the vesicular follicle and now enters the oviduct. Um, and uh, all right, so uh, uh, the last of the, uh, the, the cell division occurring, um, but here is a vesicular follicle in the ovary but under the influence of LH, those muscle cells will contract. That will expel the uh, secondary oocyte, which can enter the oviduct. And then these cells, which uh, remain, uh, these then become a hormone secreting uh, body, the corpus luteum, uh, which secretes the progesterone, which will maintain the uterine lining in case of, um, uh, of uh, conception. going to pause and get to the next picture. Ovulation, some of the cells of the follicle become the corpus luteum, which is producing the hormone progesterone. And then progesterone is causing a layer of the endometrium lining of uh, the uterus, which is known as the functional layer of the endometrium, to reach its thickest point. Uh, and thus, it's the ideal uh, place for implantation if uh, conception occurs. So when you look at and we'll have another video of this in a second, this very thick um, uterine lining. Uh, this is what was induced under the influence of uh, progesterone with these you know, endometrial glands uh, making um, uh, glycogen uh, and becoming a blood-rich uh, fluid or uh, a tissue ideal for, um, ideal for implantation. Uh, now, when uh, ovulation occurs. Um, the goal is that the oocyte is taken up by uh, this region of the oviduct known as the infundibulum. Um, so the infundibulum surrounds the ovary with these finger-like projections known as fimbriae uh, and it would like to catch the oocyte so that it doesn't end up in a different portion of the female pelvic body cavity, because that could be an ectopic pregnancy, uh, which are dangerous. Not only will it uh, will the embryo fail, but it's uh, dangerous uh, to the life of uh, the woman. Once the oocyte is taken up by the oviduct, um, then uh, there are cilia which line the uh, oviduct, and their motion helps to move this oocyte uh, towards the uh, uterus. Uh, so in addition to the movement of the fimbriae and muscle contractions of the oviduct, the oocyte then moves through the regions of the oviduct. Um, I'm sorry, the oocyte moves through the uh, regions of the oviduct, starting off with the uh, infundibulum, then to the ampulla of the ovid uh, oviduct, and then to the isthmus, where it can then uh, enter the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uterus.
Now, um, during the uh, discussion of the menstrual cycle, it's you know appropriate to focus on the ovary. There's certainly you know an ovarian cycle, um, but then also the uterus is a change. The uterus has three layers: an outer perimetrium, uh, which uh, then uh, uh, just like the pericardium of the heart or the pleura of the lungs or the peritoneum of the guts and allows one organ to move without disturbing those around it you know with blisters and adhesions so the parametrium does the same for the uterus there is a myometrium which has smooth muscle this is the muscle will which will expel uh, the head of uh, the infant during a uh, childbirth um, but also which will expel menstrual flow and also then contracts and helps to move sperm uh, upon uh, fertilization, um, or I'm sorry, uh, after uh, intercourse. Um, but then finally, there's an inner layer known as the endometrium. The endometrium has two sublayers, a basal layer, which is always present, and then a functional layer, which then develops over the course of a menstrual cycle, especially under the influence of progesterone in the second half of the menstrual uh, cycle, um, so that it reach its thickest uh, uh, point right at the time when uh, a fertilized embryo might be reaching the, um, the functional layer of the endometrium. If one were to look under the microscope, uh, one can see the uh, difference between the functional layer of the endometrium as it is being shed in menstrual flow um, because at this point blood vessels have constricted denying these cells their blood supply so they die and are sloughed off. Once the functional layer has been shed then briefly the only part of the endometrium is the basal layer that section which is always present. Um, but under the influence of estrogen and then later progesterone, uh, then uh, cell division in the endometrium is a new, uh, new layer uh, being uh, formed. Uh, here for that, the functional layer is thickest right at the time that an embryo might be reaching it uh, if fertilization had occurred during that menstrual uh, cycle. Um, so uh, in the second half of the menstrual cycle, under the influence of progesterone, this endometrium layer, the functional layer, reaches its thickest point um, and then also begins uh, to uh, use glycogen and other nutrients so it's like a tissue layer if intercourse introduces sperm into the woman's body around the time of ovulation then there is the possibility of fertilization now, the sperm actually need to be in the female's body for a bit of time before they are capable of fertilizing an embryo. And this time period is known as capacitation. And so while sperm are uh, swimming uh, through uh, the female reproductive system, uh, through the uterus up a fallopian tube, perhaps at the time that uh, ovulation uh, is occurring, they are undergoing this uh, capacitation. Um, and uh, as such, they might be then prepared to fertilize an embryo um, here. And this is usually the region of the female reproductive tract where fertilization occurs, what's known as the ampulla of the oviduct. So this is the infundibulum and this is the isthmus. The ampulla of the oviduct is usually uh, where uh, fertilization uh, occurs. Now, at the moment of uh, fertilization, a number of things happen. Once again, um, the sperm has to dissolve its way through these blue epithelial cells from the ovary, uh, which came with it uh, from uh, ovulation. Uh, and once it does, it then uh, penetrates the uh, ovum. This will stimulate it to complete its last cell division so that uh, what was a secondary oocyte becomes an ovum and this polar body may or may not div uh, divide so that the uh, uh, female uh, gametogenesis produces one ovum which can be fertilized and then a couple of cells uh, which are non-functional. Uh, so this could then result in a diploid uh, zygote. Um, Uh, there are a couple of other you know, considerations which are occurring right at that moment 
of uh, fertilization. Um, first is uh, no one sperm has enough enzyme to break through the protein uh, junctions which are uh, uniting these uh, blue uh, epithelial cells, the corona radiata. And so therefore, um, what is required for fertilization is that maybe 50 to 100 sperm are in the vicinity of the oocyte, all banging their little heads against uh, these cells so that the enzymes being released can cause the lining to disintegrate to the point where one can penetrate. And so because one sperm doesn't have sufficient enzyme for this uh, uh, to occur, uh, then the, the number, uh, then uh, the issue of sperm number becomes important. So uh, it's not enough for fertilization for one sperm to reach the oocyte. It's going to require, say, 50 to 100 in the same place at the same time. Now, even if there are um, millions of sperm in an ejaculate per milliliter, um, many die uh, upon encountering the acid of the vagina. Many were abnormal to begin with, even in healthy males. Many will swim up the wrong fallopian tube because uh, in a typical month, only one fallopian tube has an oocyte uh, in it. And so therefore, um, a man who makes too little sperm simply isn't going to get 50 to 100 uh, sperm in the right place at the right time and would therefore uh, be uh, infertile. Uh, uh, so that is a concern and also a concern because in our society, uh, measures have shown that sperm counts seem to be dropping and there are multiple possible you know, uh, culprits, you know, whether from stress or uh, extra sources of estrogen that males are exposed to or other uh, chemicals. Um, and so thus dropping sperm counts could potentially have um, uh, issues uh, increasing the frequency of infertility. Now, while too few sperm, you know, is a concern, so would too many, because if uh, multiple sperm are trying to enter the oocyte all at the same time, well, then this would potentially create the problem of polyspermy, where if multiple sperm enter, then this would have result in too many chromosomes in the embryo, and the embryo would fail. So notice all of these yellow vesicles just inside the cell membrane. Once the first sperm uh, enters, the oocyte will now depolarize and release the products of these vesicles, which will then attempt to prevent polyspermy, then uh, prevent uh, the, uh, the penetration of additional sperm. So upon the moment of fertilization, the oocyte changes in a way that attempts uh, to prevent the entry of, um, uh, of a multiple uh, sperm. Now, I have far more videos on uh, reproduction, uh, on the reproductive systems. And now that we're talking about an actual uh, zygote, uh, I have you know, many more videos on embryonic uh, uh, development um, because you know, this is absolutely fascinating because here we have one single microscopic cell with 46 chromosomes, um, but that is now enough uh, of you know, genetic information uh, to then guide the development to make a brain, to make arms and legs, to make organ systems, and you know, uh, uh, the infant which will be born nine uh, months uh, later. And so uh, I have a number of videos which then to you know trace this, whether this be the beginning stages where a zygote you know then begins to divide, form a solid bowl of cells, the uh, morula, which then becomes a hollow bowl of cells which is reaching the uterus. Uh, the uh, blastocyst, uh, which then you know starts to develop you know uh, tissues in gastrulation, it is a fascinating uh, process. Um, but you know one that goes a bit beyond uh, what I intended for this quick introduction. So I have far more videos if uh, you know the stages of embryonic development, say the development of the nervous system, uh, differentiation of cells using different genes, etc. If that's of interest. Um, but otherwise, this was just kind of a introduction on how the uh, male and female reproductive systems then produce haploid sex cells. Uh, they encounter each other, and this then starts the generation 
of you know a new human individual.